we've done it. This is the final insect order left to cover on this channel. And to truly put a cap on this project, we need to go back to the beginning. Back to the most primitive of all the insect orders. I'd say they're living dinosaurs, but the Archeognatha existed far before they did. Welcome to the Insect Spotlight Project, a channel dedicated to shining a light on insects, spiders, and any other creepy crawlies that get left out of the ecologic spotlight. Today, we're talking about the order Archeognatha, better known as the Bristletails or the Jumping Bristletails. Just be careful, because there is a group of non-insect arthropods called the Diplurans or the Two-Pronged Bristletails, but most of the time when people say bristletail, they are referring to the Archeognatha. The Archeognatha are ancient, and seem to have diverged from the other insects around 400 million years ago back in the late Devonian period, earning them the title of the oldest living or extant insect order. To put this in perspective, the sister group to the Archeognatha is the Dicondylia, which is a grouping of every other insect order. So if you made a family tree, the oldest split in the insect lineage would be between the Archeognatha and everything else. Because of this early divergence, jumping bristletails seem very weird, not just in their ecology, but also in their morphology or appearance. The first thing you may notice is that they completely lack wings. And this isn't an evolved them and then lost them situation like most wingless insects. The Archeognatha never evolved them in the first place. The only other order of insects to have never evolved wings is the Zygentoma, or the silverfish, the ones we covered in the last video. As mentioned in that video, these two orders used to be combined into a single order, the Thysanura, but this was found to be paraphyletic, so they couldn't trace everything back to one common ancestor, hence the split. They do kind of look similar though, so as I'm going through the Archeognatha morphology, I'll draw comparisons with the Zygentoma so you can learn to tell them apart. The Archeognatha have an elongate oval shape and long antennae, as well as three caudal filaments extending from their abdomen. The outer filaments are the cerci, and the middle one is the epiproct, referred to as the median caudal filament. Now, in the Archeognatha, the cerci are going to be much shorter than the median caudal filament. But in the Zygentoma, they tend to be around the same length. Unlike silverfish, which are flattened dorsoventrally, like a pancake, the Archeognatha are flattened more laterally, giving them a compressed, hunched-backed appearance. Another weird trait of the Archeognatha are the aversible vesicles on their venter, or underside. Now, these can help to uptake water from wet substrate, an important trait considering they have a thinner exoskeleton than most insects which makes water conservation a little bit more difficult. They tend to be neutral colored, and like the silverfish, they're coated in fine scales. And this is more than just a glossy appearance. It also makes it very difficult for predators to grab onto them, as they're quite slippery. It also might help them squeeze through tight spaces. If you zoom in on the face, you'll notice they have incredibly long maxillary palps, those structures by the mouth. And these are used for sensing their environment, but also for balance, climbing, and in some cases, reproductive behaviors. They've got prominent compound eyes and a pretty small head relative to their body, both of which help to distinguish them from the silverfish. Fun fact, you'll sometimes hear people refer to this group as the microcoryphia, which translates to small head, because they have a small head. This name is technically the oldest one, and therefore, the correct one. However, it was only published 11 days prior to the name Archeognatha, so both of them are used pretty interchangeably. Speaking of names, you ready for the complicated part? You'll sometimes hear them referred to as the Monocondylia, which is a subclass that contains only the Archeognatha, and it's the flip side to the subclass Dicondylia, which we mentioned earlier. This is because Archeognatha were thought to only have one attachment point, or condyle, for each of their mandibles, monocondylic. This is as opposed to other insects, which have two, dicondylic. However, it seems Archeognatha actually do have two, so it makes this name kind of weird. For all intensive purposes, you can just call them the Archeognatha and be done with it. But wait, Archeognatha also refers to their mouthparts. 
Archaeos, ancient. Nathos, jaw, ancient, jawed. But that's okay. Because although they do have two condyles, they're attached a little bit differently from other insects, so it's still a unique trait to be referenced. Besides the Zygentoma, the Archaeognatha are the only other order of insects to be ametabolous, without metaboly. So their life stage still goes from egg to juvenile to adult, but the juvenile and adults look very similar to one another and occupy the same niches. No metamorphosis for them. Like the Zygentoma, the Archaeognatha also continue to molt even after they reach maturity. Now, this is unlike most insects, which stop molting once they reach their adult stage. But this is partly because they have wings, and wings are difficult to molt with. But no wings, no problem. Jumping bristletails will lay a dozen or two eggs in crevices or soft substrate. And if the conditions aren't favorable, they can lay dormant for around a year or so. In terms of habitat, jumping bristletails normally like more moist environments, but they can make do in some arid conditions, occupying regions like chaparral or even deserts. But whatever biome they hatch into, the jumping bristletails get to work, scavenging around for lichens, mosses, algae, decaying plant matter, whatever. They grow pretty slowly, and they can take up to two years before reaching maturity. During this time, they have to avoid predation, so they hide out in crevices and under rocks and logs and the like. But they also have a trick up their sleeve. Archaeognatha are called the jumping bristletails for a reason. When they're threatened, they'll hit their abdomen on the ground and push off to leap into the air and hopefully out of harm's way. If they last to maturity, they may be lucky enough to reproduce. Archaeognatha may have a few different rituals for reproduction, but regardless of the specifics, sperm transfer is external. Some bristletails do what many silverfish do, and create silken threads with droplets of sperm or spermatophores, basically packages of sperm, for the female to uptake with her ovipositor. These threads are called carrier threads. The details can vary. Some males will initiate with females by drumming with their maxillary palps. Many will actively lead females over the spermatophores to ensure uptake. And some will just cut out the middleman entirely and deposit sperm directly onto the ovipositor. Regardless, the cycle continues. If they're lucky, jumping bristletails can live for three to four years, leading a peaceful life of algal grazing. I feel like I have something in my throat when I say that, like algal, algal grazing. Unlike the silverfish, jumping bristletails aren't really huge fans of our homes. They tend to keep to their own natural habitats, cycling nutrients back into their environments and doing their part to keep their ecosystem healthy and functioning. As we discussed, Archaeognatha are found in a multitude of habitats, but they tend to still like moisture and organic debris. So having leaf litter or coarse woody debris on your property can be great to provide them some shelter and potential food, and having native plantings and such can help provide shade for those moist microhabitats to persist. I've personally found success finding them by looking near stones and such by water features like little creeks. These living relics are irreplaceable and an amazing look into the ancient invertebrate world. I'm really glad we got to wrap up this project with such an amazing order. We have now covered every order within the class Insecta, but have no fear. This is far from the end of this channel. Non-insect groups, family level videos, and deeper dives into ecologic concepts await us in the future. So if you like the content and you wanna stick around, please remember to like and subscribe to keep up to date with future videos. Thank you all for the continued support through this channel, and I really look forward to what the future holds. And if I missed any fun jumping bristletail facts, or if you have any personal experiences with them, please leave them in the comments below. I always love hearing about it. Peace, y'all.